that as we enter this place to worship this morning, we do so only in Christ. We approach the holiness and come near to him only through Christ. And so what he has done for us, his obedience, his perfect righteousness, that we may live before him and we may continue to serve him always. And so we hear then of that great assurance and really that great encouragement in Hebrews chapter 10. We've read this in conjunction with the tabernacle, but in case you missed it, hear it again. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That in the light of what Jesus has done for us, that is why we draw near. How do we hold fast the confession? By holding fast to Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. So that as we consider how to spur each other on to love and good works, we do so not for our fame and not for our glory, but for his. Not as a testimony to who we are, but to who he is. And that's the wonder then of the Christian life, that he uses us, ambassadors, for the kingdom of heaven to go forth and speak the gospel good news of Jesus Christ. I pray that that is your hope and your comfort this morning. If it is not, cry out to the Lord, this is the day of salvation. Believe in Jesus Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, and that we may rejoice together in great joy. And so we come then before the presence of God through Christ, and let's do that together in our morning prayer. Let's all pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, there is indeed great wonder and blessing in being drawn near to you today. And Father, that's true every week. It's true every time that you call us to pray. It's true every moment of every day as you walk with us, as you fill us and you build us together a church, a dwelling place for you by your Spirit. And Father, we pray that that is not lost on us. The wonder of what we do here, the wonder of your meeting us here, the wonder of that grace. Father, help us not to take it for granted. But Father, also, might you give to us a wonder of the fact that you're doing a work of calling a people to yourself, that you're gathering in a harvest. And Father, we think a lot of the harvest right now. As the tractors drive around, as the combines do their work, Father, as the, the grain bins are towed here and there, Father, we are mindful. Our farmers among us, they see it. They see it each and every day. The joy of, of the wonder of serving you, of the wonder of, of seeing a bounty that you give, that you give just what you will in the best way that it may be brought in. And Father, we see it in bins, Lord. You provide. And so, Father, as we think of these things and we rejoice in it, praying for our farmers that you would continue to care for them and uphold them, Father, we think of our calling in Jesus Christ. That, Father, your Son told the apostles to, to lift up their eyes and to look, that the fields were white with harvest, that even in this harvest time, Father, we pray, help us to see the promise of Christ. That as the fields are white with harvest, Father, so is this world. That in the seeds that you have planted by your word, there are those that are called to come in, to be gathered in to your house among your people. But Father, it's easy, whether in the throes of that harvest work or just in life in general, to think too little of that promise. Perhaps not even to think of it at all. In fact, Father, we rest and we slumber, content in the things of this world and in the distractions of the day, 
rather than giving ourselves to that work. In the Proverbs, it's foolish. Here's the harvest and we wouldn't go out to gather it or, or we would only gather a part of it or, or just enough for the now and hope that the rest is there later. No, in the time of harvest, now is the time to, to work and to pull and to spend those long days and those long nights. Father, to continue to do that work until all that you have promised is brought in. And so, Father, how much more us in the light of the gospel truth, in the wonder of the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus Christ, in a lost and dying world that has no hope, that needs hope, and that hope is Jesus. Father, give us to that work. Instill in us a greater passion and a greater zeal in these days to that task as ambassadors, kingdom servants, harvest workers. And Father, we would trust knowing that you provide a harvest in your time, that you give what is best, and that, Father, you will equip us and strengthen us with everything good for that task. And so, Father, make us all farmers, not just those who work on a farm, all of us, tenders, stewards, Father, of that which you have afforded to us and granted to us. And as you, Lord Jesus, go forth faithfully in your word and Holy Spirit to scatter that seed and to spread it, Father, we look forward to a day where the sower is met already by the reaper. And Father, you bring what is good, what is best, and in the fullness of that promise. And so we trust in it, Lord. But in that trust, make us willing workers, faithful servants, ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we thank you that we can see that around us here. And Father, none of us were, were those who were afforded a place because of us or what we've done or what we've said or what we know. And Father, we've been gathered in too that the church, Lord, is a, a collection of the saints. It is a grain bin, a place where that harvest is brought in to rejoice in you and to be used, Father, in that greater harvest. And so, Father, we thank you for your grace in building your church. We thank you for your grace in building this church. And we thank you for the ways that you are working by your word and Holy Spirit here in this place. And so, Father, continue that work. Continue it in the days in which we might become discouraged, disenfranchised, hurt, struggling, Father, with your will and way in our lives in whatever way that might be. Father, drive us to the promise. You build a church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Bring us again to the promise that you are faithful to gathering in your people from every tongue and tribe and nation. Father, you are faithful to that great commission as we are sent out to go and make disciples of all nations. Father, may our trust and our hope in the church be not in what we see, but as you see. That as we are called not to look at the circumstances of our lives with fear, but rather with faith. Father, may we look at the circumstances of faith, not in fear, but in faith. And that, Father, you would continue to work what is good and pleasing in us. We pray that you would do that by the hands of our elders and deacons. We thank you for them. And pray, Father, that you would bless them in the exercises of their ordained offices. Lord, as we come together tomorrow for counsel and consistory and deacons meetings, we pray your wisdom and grace. Father, as the church visitors come and spend some time with us in in checking up on our church and In providing wise counsel, we pray that you would bless them. Bless Reverend Noble and Reverend Freswick. Might our time together may be sweet. May it give testimony to your faithfulness. May it show us, Father, those ways in which we may continue to strive together to do that which is good and pleasing before you. And so bless those times together. Father, we pray that you bless our classes meeting in this week as well. We thank you for our sister churches in Classes, Michigan, asking that you would bless each pulpit, each consistory and council Father, each member, may we continue to resound together with a message that we are about that great commission, that we are about reaching lost souls with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so may we be spurred on together to greater love and greater works of service in unity together. And so bless our time together. May it be sweet and may you be praised in it. And Father, for the rest of the activities of our church in this week, Father, for the Bible studies that we'll meet, bless them. Father, for the opportunities we have as youth groups to be together. Father, as we look ahead in just the ways today of of catechism and Sunday school and adult Sunday school, thank you for these opportunities to grow closer to you and closer to each other. And Father, we thank you that in so doing, you gather us together as a people 
to pray, to pray for the lost, to pray for the salvation of sinners, to pray for your work in the lives of our children, in the lives of our schools, in the lives of our country and nation, Father, in the lives of each other, for those who hurt and struggle and suffer with various things, mental or physical or spiritual, be near unto them. Father, we think especially of those that will have surgery this week. We pray for Kerry Camps, asking that you will be with him in his hip replacement. Lord, might you grant relief to him and comfort. Keep him from infection. Keep him from unnecessary pain. And bless he and Lois together as they seek to walk through this now and again in a few months more. And so bless them and uphold them. Father, we also pray that you would bless Dr. Bill. Lord, we've prayed for him much and often. We continue to do so. We thank you, Father, for a a plan forward for surgery to take place. And yet, Lord, we know it is with much risk. All surgery is that way. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless our brother with assurance, a calm trust in you and in your word. That, Father, you will bless his family as they surround him in encouragement and prayer as well. And so, Father, we know your will will be done. It always is. But we pray, Father, that you would bless our brother and keep him always. And Father, we pray too for for Elaine. Lord, in the news that she has received this week of a a positive cancer diagnosis, Lord, it it is a difficult providence. It is a hard one indeed. And yet, Father, we pray that through further tests, a a way forward of treatment would be given, that surgery could take place. Father, that, that therapy in whatever way would take place and that it would be effective. And that, Father, in this time, Elaine would have quick voice ready to speak of your faithfulness, of your sustaining mercies, and your care for her and her family. And so bless, Father, this family together as they walk this road. We think the same of John and Sandy, Lord. Continue to uphold our brother as he becomes more weak, Father, in those ways that he's not even able to communicate in the way that he would like to each and every time we see him. Father, we know that he holds on to your word that if nothing else, he is able to give a confident yes to the gospel promise of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, continue to bless this couple together with with peace that passes all understanding, that you would guard them together. And, Father, for, for Cal and Jane, we pray that you would be near unto them as they worship with us via live stream. Lord, we miss them, we love them, we care for them. And, Father, we pray that they would know your nearness and your peace in this day of worship as well. Father, bless Cheryl. We think of Luke as he cares for her. And, and Father, in that time of recovery, we are thankful for the improvement that you have given. And yet, Father, we pray that you would work mightily in Cheryl, that, Lord, you would continue to drive her to your word, that, that Lord, you would work to heal her body, that you would heal her mind, that you would grant her a willing spirit to sustain her, and that, Lord, you would help them to rejoice together in your steadfast love. And so bless Luke. Give him what he stands in need of as well to be a faithful minister of Christ. Bless Ryan, Lord, in his continued fight against pain and and just the discomfort, Lord, that comes along with it. We ask that you would bless Ryan and Carla, care for them. And Father, again, we pray for our littles. We think of Avery and and Jade. We think of Ted and Thea as they pray for their grandson, Desmond. Lord, we, we don't stop. We don't stop praying for any of them. That, Lord, how little they are, Lord, the the illnesses and viruses that float about. Father, spare them, keep them. May growth continue to take place and may parents be comforted in the truth of Jesus Christ. We think that especially for Ted and Thea's children, Lord, drive them to Christ. Give them a hope in the gospel and may this be the day of salvation for them as well. And so, Father, in all of these things, we have much to pray about. We have much to rejoice in. We think of those who have had children married in this past week. Lord, bless them. Establish those homes, not just in an institution, but, Father, in a covenant, in Christ. And so, Lord, we pray, might you continue to uphold them together as well. And so, Lord, we we come before you knowing that we need to pray without ceasing to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is your will. And so, Father, as we close this time of prayer, may we not stop. Not stop praying for you and your will not stop praying for that harvest because, Father, when it's gathered and it's all brought in, your Son will come again on the clouds to take us to Himself. And so, Lord, give us a greater longing, a greater passion for that in the promise of Jesus Christ. And we ask all these things in His name. Amen. 
Let's sing together as we prepare our hearts to receive that word, number 419 in the Psalter hymnal. 419, thus saith the mercy of the Lord. Let's stand to sing all the stanzas, 419. I'd ask that you take up your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17, where we come to the familiar passage in terms of God's promise, as well as that sign that he gives to his people of circumcision, which may on the surface seem somewhat strange. Why are we talking about circumcision when in the catechism we are talking about baptism? And yet at the end of the Lord's Day that we'll recite together, there is that sense of circumcision in the Old Testament has been replaced in the New Testament by baptism. And so we want to hold that before us this morning as context for an understanding of that which is promised to us. And so we're going to read these words together, Genesis 17. We'll read the entire chapter, and then we'll take for our text the first 14 verses this morning before turning over to Lord's Day 27. Hear now the word of the Lord. Genesis 17, verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God to you and your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. 
And the uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son and all those born in his house, or bought with his money every male among the men of Abraham's house. And he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. As far as the reading of God's holy word, let's again take up the summary of that word, turning in the Trinity Psalter and the Maroon Psalter in front of you. Turning there to page 884, 884 in the back pages of that hymnal. As we confess in one voice together the words of Lord's Day 27. And so let's speak these together. I'll read the questions and then we'll respond with the answers. Question 72 asks, does this outward washing with water itself wash away sins? We answer, no, only Jesus Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit cleanse us from all sins. Why then does the Holy Spirit call baptism the water of rebirth and the washing away of sins? God has good reason for these words. To begin with, he wants to teach us that the blood and spirit of Christ take away our sins just as water removes dirt from the body. But more importantly, he wants to assure us by this divine pledge and sign that we are as truly washed of our sins spiritually as our bodies are washed with water physically. And then should infants also be baptized? Yes, infants as well as adults are included in God's covenant and people. And they, no less than adults, our promised deliverance from sin through Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit who works faith. Therefore, by baptism, the sign of the covenant, they too should be incorporated into the Christian church and distinguished from the children of unbelievers. This was done in the Old Testament by circumcision, which was replaced in the New Testament by baptism. Thus far, our confession. Let's ask for the Lord's help together in understanding this word. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as you draw us close to yourself by way of your word, by way of this teaching of baptism, thank you for this sign and seal you give to us to point us to Christ, to the wonder of his sacrifice, to the wonder of washing that is found only in him. And so, Father, as we consider your covenant in the life of Abraham, more in our own life together as a body. Father, may you be praised in it. Work salvation by it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In congregation, beloved of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, sometimes it seems that when we speak of infant baptism together, we're in a way disappointed. And we're disappointed in the fact that the Lord has only given a promise and not a reality. Think about that just for a moment. Disappointment in a promise because we haven't been given a reality. And those thoughts in the life of the church have led people into either a desire to teach an 
unbiblical baptismal regeneration, saying that in the thing, they have it. As a child is baptized, he has salvation. It is contrary to the Scriptures. Or in a, the other direction, they abandon the biblical teaching of infant baptism altogether. But that's puzzling to me. And it should be to you as well, simply in thinking about the fact that there are all sorts of times in our lives that we are just perfectly fine to accept promises instead of realities. When you loan someone money, you give out a promissory note. This person has promised that they will pay back the money that I have loaned. But you don't have the money. You have a promise, but not a reality. Kids, when you receive a gift card for Christmas or your birthday, you don't have a reality, you have a promise. You don't hold that plastic card and say, thank you for this ginormous Nerf blaster that I just got from you, Mom. No, you have a piece of paper, you have a card, you have a promise, but not a reality. It's not much on its own, is it? But it holds the power of that promise. For when you walk into the store, you will enjoy all the Nerf gun benefits and value of that promise. Think about that in terms, then, of the sacrament of baptism. That what you receive there is no less powerful. You have a promise. What one receives at the font is a promise. The Lord promises His people the washing away of all their sins in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And when given faith to believe by God, we surely have what is promised. For the one who gives is always faithful. And therefore, we should not look down or allow others to look down on that which has been given to us in the sign and seal but rather we should be quickened and ready to heed the call to believe it, to receive all of the benefits of that promise in Jesus Christ. And that's really the power of the promise made then in Genesis 17 as well. And yet we've received a better one. Ours is a better promise, a more powerful one through a Savior who delivers it all to us. We see this theme this morning in baptism. We receive a powerful promise of the deliverance from sin. And we want to look then at that promise being an inheritance. It'll be a key word this morning. And so we have an inheritance in the promise in verses 1 through 8. We are given instruction in the promise in verses 9 through 13. And then we see the inclusion in that promise in verses 13b and 14. That in baptism, we receive a powerful promise of the deliverance from sin, and it's a sure promise. And that first point this morning, this is a sure promise, but it's not a sure reality. Again, that's the struggle, and that struggle certainly in our hearts is a real one. In fact, in the examples that I just gave, some of you might look at those things, a promissory note or a gift card as sure things. Here's the value that they express. But there's no guarantee that someone will pay you back. The promise is only as good as the one who makes it. You may have a gift card, but you might not spend every amount that's on that card. You have a promise, but you haven't received all of it. But you have a promise nonetheless. And so in baptism, we focus on that promise, giving the sign and seal itself no more value than it ought to be given. Does this outward washing with water itself wash away sins? No. Only Jesus Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit cleanse us from all sin. So in the sacrament, you are not given a now reality. Let us never believe such an awful, unbiblical superstition but rather you have the promise of an inheritance. Again, that term is important because no one in and of themselves has the power to bring about the promise of an inheritance. Only an almighty God does. 
Only he can give what is promised. And that reality is seen in the life of Abram. If your Bibles are open, look again, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. The Lord takes time to to reintroduce himself to Abram. I am. I am the I am. I am almighty. I am all powerful. I am able to bring anything that I promise into existence. I make my will reality. And so the Lord sets Abram apart unto himself by way of the promise. Yes, it is made a reality by faith, but nonetheless, what he has granted in the sign, even as we will look at it, is a promise. And it is a promise, certainly, that is not about Abram's doing. No, he sets him apart, not because of his works. He sets him apart so that God might keep his promises in him and in his offspring. That even Abram, in being called to walk with God, walks it how? In a promise. How can he be blameless? Because of a promise and because God is almighty. Which speaks what to us in baptism? That this promise that is given is graciously and amazingly awesome. It is a great wonder. But one that we can do nothing in our power to bring about. We can't bring that note to someone else and say, give it to us. No. You see, we need an almighty God to save us and work the reality of his promise that we may share in his promised inheritance. That you, brothers and sisters, have that great promise of an inheritance only because of the grace of Jesus Christ. That even now, it is still and always will be a promise of grace. And it's a humbling one. Verse 3, then Abram fell on his face. He's overwhelmed. He's humbled in this promise. This is what I will do. It's enough because I know who makes the promise. And yet what is more overwhelming is the fact that the promise of that inheritance is not only Abram's. No, it was and is for future generations too. For all that the Lord our God will call unto himself. That he takes his promise and he makes it effectual in his way and his time. But that doesn't change the nature of the inheritance. It doesn't change the nature of the promise. It's still good. It's still gracious. And God said to him, verse 4, Behold, look, take the time, Abram. My covenant is with you. Again, not because of anything you did. It is with you because I say it. And you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations and kings come from you. That he's saying unequivocally, my promise is yours. I have made you thus. I will make you thus. You man, good as dead, 99 years old, I will do it. I can bring life from death. I can bring joy from sorrow. I can work restoration. That this promise that is his to give is also that which he is mighty to fulfill. Verse 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. This promise isn't going to go away. This promise isn't going to be broken to be a God to you and your offspring after you. Hear it clearly. The promise of that inheritance was an everlasting one for those who are truly of Abraham. It's the shift that happens in the New Testament, right? Not all Abraham are Abraham. Not all church is church. Not all baptized are baptized. You see, it was a word of future promise. It was a word of future grace. And it's striking because in Abraham's life right now, what does he have? He has Ishmael. We hear that and is crying out to the Lord. 
be with him. No, it's not my way. Abraham right now has nothing, no son, no line of promise. And so Abraham is given promises before any of those children, any of those generations are born. That's how the Lord works. Before the foundations of a world, I make a plan and I bring it about. He raises up children and people for himself, those that he elects and he calls, those he enters into covenant with, and he gives them a promised inheritance of future grace unto all those whom he will call to himself in repentance and faith. And what is that inheritance? Verse 8, I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and the best part, I will be their God. To be God to you. He will be their God. And why is that important? Because the one who makes the promise is faithful. This promise would come about not because of Abraham, certainly not because of Ishmael, not because of any of the natural children of Abraham, but the one who was of his seed in the work of a son, the king that the Lord God would send, our Savior Jesus Christ. He is the surety of an inheritance for us. In his work are we made children because he is the son of a promise. He is almighty and strong to save. And so when we consider the promise of the font, when we hold on to that and we hold out that promise of a great inheritance for us in Christ, not only to each other but also to our children, we do so in the promise of grace. And we do so as a testimony to the world before all of them as we seek to make disciples that there is grace to be found in the washing of Jesus Christ. Is that inheritance yours? Again, don't presume upon it. Children, we do it all the time. Is that promise yours? Well, I was baptized. It's not what I said. You've been given a promise. Is yours a reality? Only Jesus and his spirit wash me from sin. Trust in then that now and future grace that can only be ours in Jesus Christ. Believe it and receive it, even as Abraham did, that he might know in the instruction of God what was promised, and that in second place we come to instruction, and certainly that instruction is known throughout the whole covenant. It's known in the revelation of whom the main action of the covenant belongs. This is the Lord. I am. And yet what the Lord does in graciously setting up a covenant is do what? He fulfills both sides of it. He gives to us then after that the task of keeping it. I've kept it, but now I call you to keep it. Verse 9, and God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. You see, as those set apart and consecrated to God by way of those same promises, He wants us to live them. Live that promise in faith and in gratitude. That is the call of the promise. That in being given an inheritance, we are to long for and walk to receive that which is promised. We want the inheritance. We want the payment. We want the blessing. There it is. And yet, what does the Lord require of you? Be obedient, save yourself, show it to God, and he'll give it to you? He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to act justly and to love mercy and walk humbly with your God. Why? I have kept my promise for you. That's why. He simply asks you and instructs you to be holy and walk with him in thanks for the covenant that he has made and kept. And that action is made known as the Lord instructed Abraham concerning the covenant that he had literally in the Hebrew cut. That's the word in the Hebrew for making a covenant. You cut 
a covenant. And so as his covenant is one that is cut, so too in the Old Testament was it signed. Verse 10, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. This is what I ask you in my promise. That's it. I want you to cut something away as a reminder always that I have cut something for you. And the wonder is the the joy of the fact that that sign is not just for Abraham, not just for his future son, but for all those who belonged to his house. We see that in verses 11 through 13. I'm not going to reread those. But we see the scope of the promise, right? Here is the instruction that God brings of a covenant, which is what? The Lord works by way of covenant families. Here is our joy in it. And yet that promise and that cutting promised to him and to his sons and to all that were of his house was not an end in itself, but something that was to affect and impact every part of their life. And yet the thing itself was not the cutting. That's what we focus on even when we read this. Look at that bloody covenant that is made among that whole family. Look at the pain and the sorrow that is gone through now amongst this whole family. We look at the sign and we want to give the sign more power than it has. It's not the sign, it is the promise. And so an instruction in the terms of the cost and way of the covenant, instruction is made plain. Something has been and must be removed from you, and that is uncleanness. Something has been and must be changed about you physically, namely the shedding of uncleanness and the shedding of blood. Something has been and must be changed about you spiritually, for I have cut a covenant with you, And you are to keep that cutting consecrated to me alone. And yet the cutting does not bring about the receipt of the inheritance. Did you notice that list of people who are circumcised when Abraham keeps the covenant? Ishmael is circumcised. Everyone who belonged to his house was circumcised. Did they all believe the promise? It's what's railed against infant baptism. You baptize children who aren't going to embrace Jesus Christ. And so do those who only ascribe to adult baptism. Here is a covenant of which God says, I call you to be faithful and keep it. You be faithful and thanks for what I've worked in you. I will take care of my will. Be faithful but I will do it. And so that instruction in terms then needs to be plain for us. That such a removal and change cannot be brought about in our own strength or our power or righteousness. It cannot be brought about in our covenant nurture or instruction. It will not be brought about by our discipline. We need something far better than circumcision. And that's the point. No, we need more than a sign. We need the Almighty God to work in us the grace and faith to bring about that covenant reality for us, impacting our life in every day, in every way, for the sake of Christ and his gospel good news. We need someone to come and take our uncleanness from us that we would be made clean everlasting. We need the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But we do not need the shedding of man's blood or the blood of bulls or goats or rams. They can't atone for sin. No, we need the blood of a Savior to remove our guilt and atone for our sins. And the one who does that alone in his power and his grace and his love is Jesus. He has accomplished all of the promise of circumcision on the cross of Calvary. 
so that we would know with certainty that the inheritance is ours because forgiveness is truly ours in him. That if we are found in Christ, what is ours today, you will be with me in paradise. Not just a promise, but a reality. It's the truth Paul writes in Colossians 2. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. The putting off of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Don't just have the promise of what his death has done. Embrace the promise of what his life has promised you in him. Both. And so when we see that the Lord has given us in this sacrament something far better than circumcision could have ever promised, what we point ahead to is washing in Jesus. Why then does the Holy Spirit call baptism the water of rebirth and washing away of sin? God has good reason for this word. For to begin with, he wants to teach us that the, body, or the blood and spirit of Christ take away our sins just as water removes dirt from the body. But more importantly, he wants to assure us by this divine pledge and sign that we are as truly washed of our sins spiritually as our bodies are washed with water physically. He gives us a sign of assurance. For when we embrace that sign, as we embrace that seal by faith, that assurance is ours. That covering is real. That washing is for us. That atonement is perfectly applied. That guilt is removed. That peace is attained. That joy is forever. And the wonder of this is the fact that he includes us in it and our children. There's an inclusion in the promise that briefly in the last place. For hear it again, for that promise is for you and for your children. But our children don't have that faith yet. Those children were not saved because of their circumcision, just as ours are not saved by way of baptism. That's right. That's because the nature of signs and seals that we keep coming back to is what it is. The cutting is not the covenant, but rather the sign of it. Our baptism is not the covenant, but the sign and seal of it. Again, hear it clearly. Those actions are about a promise, not a reality. The promise is meant to lead us to the receipt of a reality. And so is those. All of us in the covenant families found in this place, the Lord's desire for his own is that they would embrace the wonder of that inclusion. That you would be saved in the promise and that you would live for him and with him forever. That truth is no different for you and I as it is for our children. That call is still the same, repent and believe. Don't give your children half of what the covenant is by just telling them they were baptized. Speak to them the truth of wonder and grace in Christ. Call them to repentance and to faith. Show them in a life of it how you are led there. Don't let the sign do it. Speak it. Teach them. Show them. We need inclusion in the promise. We need its application and reality. And so it's an inclusion of dependence. As those brought into the promise, what do we share with our children? We can't bring this about. Dad and mom are not righteous enough to save themselves. We need a Savior, and so do you. And we need it in our life. We need it to be effective in our flesh. We need an everlasting promise that we may have assurance. And so the Lord makes it plain. Depend on me. That's what that shows us. But it also needs to remind us of why we've been included in that promise. And so what do we also share with our kids? Be saved, but be distinct. It's an inclusion of distinction. Because in being granted access to that promise, children, you are to live in the joy of that too. 
in what Jesus has spoken and made plain to you in placing his name upon you. You see, you are given access to a promise, a sign and seal of baptism. You are devoted to his promise and his covenants. You are distinguished and separated from the world. And your inclusion in that promise is a blessing. Speak to anyone who's been converted and brought into our church. This is a blessing. That you have been committed by your parents to the hearing of the gospel again and again and again and again and again and again. What a testimony. I don't know a day in my life where I didn't know the love of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. It's how he works in promise. But the greater blessing is the embrace of that promise by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. Because there's a harsh reality we need to close with in verse 14, right? Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. The sign is to be applied to be remembered, and to be lived out. And so if you're just peddling on that, young people, I was baptized. I'm a part of the church. But you have embraced the truth of this reality. Hear it clearly. You will be cut off. And we hate the talk of it, right? How could the elders do that to that man, that girl, How could they cut them off? How could they exclude them from the fellowship? How could they do that? Because they will not embrace the gospel. This isn't about them. It's about the name of Christ. It's about his grace and his mercy. And it's about telling the real tale. We will not allow our young people to sit in pews with a fascination of I've been baptized, but not a reality, holding on to a gift card, but not embracing its truth. We won't do it. Not because they need the gospel less, but because we need to know in our hearts that they need it more, more. And that we are committed as brothers and sisters in Christ to speak it. Not have truths, full truths. We are not worthy of that kind of promise. But he places it upon our children so that we would be faithful to continuing to bring them before it. That their baptism would point them in and through us more in his word to the grace and faith of the Lord. And so let us redouble our efforts, brothers and sisters, those who claim this promise, to raise our children mindful of the distinction that God has made into bringing them into his covenant, the great advantages, but also the application to repent and believe and to respond to the gracious promises of God, even in the knowledge of the great inheritance that is ours in Christ. Don't stop halfway at compliance. Don't do it. Don't delude yourself into thinking they go to the right school or they're from the right family or they've had the right baptism or they're surrounded in the right church. Call them to repentance and faith again and again and again. Hear it from them. Yes, this Jesus is mine. Don't delay. Don't wait. And so should infants be baptized Yes, 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 yes. Infants as well as adults are included in God's covenant and people, and they know less than adults are promised deliverance from sin through Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit who works faith. They should be incorporated into the Christian church and distinguished from the children of unbelievers. Why? Because of their holiness? No, because of Christ. Because of his love and his righteousness. And so have you embraced it? That's how we're going to close this morning. Have you embraced this truth? 
Do you believe in the one who by his blood has included you and our children in this promise, calling each of us to faith in him and to a life fully consecrated to him in holiness and thanks? Is your life speaking of your baptism? Does it speak that to your kids, to our kids? That your life is one, lived fully in dependence upon Christ. Is that life one of distinction, one devoted to real holiness, not half holiness? In thanks for the great promises afforded to you in him, then believe it. <laughs> believe it and live holy lives before him in thanks for a great promise. A great reality found in our Savior who washes us clean and holy in his blood and righteousness. What a promise. What a reality. Amen. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of the gospel, the truth of this sign. And Father, we confess to you our unfaithfulness. Lord, in looking down upon it, when what you promise is a reality in Christ through your Spirit. And so, Father, let us not settle for a false assurance that our kids have been baptized and so it'll be taken care of. No. No, we trust in you and in your spirit, Father. We know that you have to do the work of regeneration and renewal. But, Father, we lay the gospel before our kids constantly. Help us to do that, never ashamed of it, never holding back from it. That, Father, the word of the gospel would be so commonplace to them because it's all they hear and it's all they see. Father, convict us. And then in lives of holiness, Father, drive us to Christ together. Drive us to the empowerment of that promise and the wonder of that inheritance. And so, Father, may we encourage each other in these things. And all the more as we see the day of Christ approach. Father, use our baptisms for the glory of your name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have opportunity on our way this morning to give of our tithes and offerings. This morning it will be for the general fund. Let's commit then this word and our gifts to the Lord from Psalter Hymnal number 389. That reminder to us, not about our hands, it's about what God has done to bring us salvation. Number 389, let's stand to sing all the stanzas.
Go out into this day assured of the Lord's parting blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.